Well, hi everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, July 12th, 2013. This week, how could we not but talk about Sharknado? Uh, we're going to be talking about an exoplanet with a blue atmosphere, New Horizons, seeing Pluto and Charon for the first time, plans for the 2020 rover, 66 years after Roswell, uh, the Atlantis exhibit. Should we send a probe to Uranus? Good question. <laughs> An update with the NASA budget and uh, activity on the sun. We've got a lot to talk about this week, but fortunately, we have brought a lot of very powerful space science, astronomy, journalist bloggers to the battle. So uh, joining me this week, we've got uh, Alan Boyle from NBC. Hi. And Alan, can we please see the raspberries? Yes, raspberries. Uh, I'm actually out of the office today, and so I was put to work uh, picking raspberries. So there you go. That. I don't know what that has to do with space, but uh, but you're just you're just so proud yummy. of them. They look delicious, <laughs> like Sharknado. Uh, it's like Sharknado, delicious like Sharknado. Uh, we've got Amy Shear Title from Vintage Space. Hello. We've got Casey Dreyer back. Hey, Casey from the Planetary Hi. Society. Nice to be here. Uh, we got David Dickinson. Hey. AKA Astro Guys, and we got uh, Dr. Matthew Francis. Is that working? Well, there's nothing profound to say at the moment. Nothing <laughs> profound to say? All right. That doesn't stop us. That's profound in itself. So, okay, so I'm Canadian. So we don't have, I don't know what channel is it, sci-fi? We don't get it. Uh, so if I want to watch it, I have to watch it on the internet, and I have to watch it through proxy. Anyway, so, so I was completely caught unawares, and I was also sort of on vacation for the last couple of days. So I return and my Twitter feed just is Sharknado this and Sharknado that. So what is this thing? Did anybody watch this? <laughs> yes, I did, <laughs> as a matter of fact. It's uh, sharks plus tornadoes. Enough said. You know, that, they don't, it's they the don't latest have... sci-fi creature feature. Can this really meat. happen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I yeah. don't think so. Okay. But there, there have been cases of uh, fish being caught up in a water spout or a tornado or something like that. But I, I think that there are actually serious science studies, uh, science uh, stories appearing on the web about uh, the potential for a Sharknado. And, and they decided that if sharks did happen to be caught up by a tornado that powerful, they'd be rendered into sushi. Uh, immediately by all the other debris that's caught up. So uh, thank God that's one thing we don't have to worry about. But but we do have to worry about cheesy sci-fi movies every once in a while uh, destroying our Twitter feed. They, they don't shoot laser beams from their eyes, do they? <laughs> that's just too much. Too much. <laughs> yeah, that would be, like, unrealistic. No. No. It's, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a shared experience. It's kind of like uh, going with your friends to the drive-in back in the days when they had drive-ins. And... Uh, so uh, it, it or mystery science theater uh, three three thousand. Uh, it, it's that sort of thing. It's so bad, it's good. Well, I think this is the situation where they just went. You know, we give up. We're just going to make what you pe we know you people want. So. <laughs> I don't know if I wanted that, but uh, yeah. A anyway, it, it's it's fun, and uh, we've got a lot of fun things in space too that uh, have more reality to it than than a good shark nail. That was a nice segue, very nicely done. <laughs> so then let's talk about, I think the big news this week is the uh, exoplanet with a blue atmosphere. And this sounds great because it is uh, a nice habitable world, I think, right? With a Not nice really. blue atmosphere, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, so the planet, let me see if I got the data here. Um, so the planet is HD 189733b. And it has been observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. And Phil Plate had, had mentioned that uh, he actually worked on the instrument that was used to determine that it's, uh, that it's, got, a blue, it's got a blue color. So uh, who, who worked on this one this week? Alan, you did, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Everybody had this story. So uh, I, I'm sure everybody is going to be able to weigh in on this one. But uh, what they did is that they, they kind of used a clever technique uh, where you look at what's, what, the, what the wavelengths coming from a star would be as a planet passes over that disk and then as it goes behind the disk and that was the key to this observation is that they tried to see uh, what the levels in various wavelengths were when the planet was just going across the edge of the disk and then going behind and they actually looked for the light that was missing and found that the light that was missing when it went when the planet went behind the disk of the sun 
uh, were in the blue wavelengths. And so that led them to conclude that uh, the reflected light from the planet itself uh, was blue. And, and that's how they figured it out. They actually detected it on the basis of what they didn't see. Uh, but in terms of being a blue planet like ours, that's not in the cards. That, that this is a so-called hot Jupiter, orbits very close to its parent star, and it's thought that the blue doesn't come from reflections from the water on the surface. It's thought that it comes from reflections of the grains of silicates that are in the atmosphere of this black gas giant and probably circling around the, the planet uh, due to winds that, uh, that reach 7,000 miles per hour. So this is not a vacation spot. It's 63 I've, light years away, so it takes a while to get there anyway. But I've, I've got a, a chunk that, that Nancy had written on Universe Today. She says, uh, it's a huge gas giant orbiting very close to its host star. It gets blasted with X-rays from its star tens of thousands of times stronger than the Earth receives from the sun and endures wild temperature swings and scorching temperatures over 1,000 degrees Celsius. It likely rains glass sideways in howling 7,000-kilometer-per-hour <laughs> winds. Just just add in sharks and you'd be all set. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Glass sharks. Uh, right. So, uh, but I mean, the technique is fantastic, right? You can imagine using this technique on a smaller Earth sized world to try and tease out maybe there's some life out there. It, it might be possible, but uh, it's very tricky with this particular technique because the the reflected light has to be strong enough that you can get a reading. And so it really wouldn't work for any sort of Earth-like, uh, Earth-size uh, planet in an Earth-like orbit around a sun-like star just because you don't get that uh, reflection that, that you really need to figure out what's happening to the light. There are other instruments, though, that will be able to do this. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of scientists are uh, trying to get ready for these future missions like TESS that will actually be able to analyze the atmosphere of alien stars, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get lots of planets of different colors just based on those future observations. But it's interesting though because I think all of the uh, <clears throat> all of the drawings that we've seen of these kinds of exoplanets, they always make them red and yellow like the, that means hot. You know, but now you're, you know, when you think of blue you think, you know, cool. Uranus, yeah. Neptune, you think of cold planets but in fact, here you go, you have a blue one that's hot and I think this is gonna this is gonna fundamentally change the way uh, artists, know, artists, artists, artists <laughs> visualizations of extrasolar planets happens from here on out. I, I've seen a paper, an astrophysics paper, that came out about a week ago. I, I need to read all the way through it this weekend, but it seems to be they're suggesting that a lot of these tidally locked planets may have a habitable area on the backside of the planet where the circulation is allowing that there's actually like a stable temperature and the bulk of the planet blocks the red dwarf out. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, this is a paper that came out like about a day or two ago. So I've got it filed away. I haven't read all the way through it, but it just kind of it caught my attention kind of sifting through stuff. If you need approval to write it, write it. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, let's move on. So uh, New Horizons spotted Pluto and Charon for the first time. Yeah, this week, uh, actually, right around the time that it's going to be doing its flyby two years from now, uh, they looked out with the, the LORI instrument, the long-range reconnaissance imager, and they actually managed to image Pluto, and as, as a plus, they for the first time, Pluto, or uh, New Horizons, got a glimpse of Karen, Sharon, how, you know, there's a bit of a controversy on the pronunciation of the name, but it's... Uh, Right now, it's about. I did a back of the envelope calculation while we were waiting for the hangout to go through. It's uh, the distance is six AU. Yeah, there's a picture of it. The distance it's six AU, which is equivalent to six times the distance from Earth to the Sun, is how far New Horizons is away right now. Pluto would be about eleventh magnitude from that position if you were out there. And they were saying the uh, separation, the arc second separation between that is about. They were saying a hundredth of an arc second, which breaks down to about thir or a hundredth of a degree which breaks down to 36 arc seconds, about the size of, angular size of Saturn, say, that we see here from Earth. So if you're out there with a small telescope, you'd be able to, and riding along with New Horizons, you could split. Uh, Pluto and, and uh, Karen would be an easy split right now. 
That's that's really cool. And I mean, we mentioned last week that we're we are waiting for actual photographs of Pluto so we can stop using the the I same know. pictures we've been using now, year now after have, year after year. We have one more we can cycle through, and in a few years, whenever we write about Pluto, we'll actually have some some real photos to, of what it actually looks like. So we don't have to keep using the same six and the same two artist conceptions that are out there that everybody uses for Pluto posts. And I thought it was interesting too that this was right around the the the, birth, the anniversary of the birth of Venetia Bernie Fair, who named Pluto. This is a girl that named Pluto in 1930. It was when they released. I don't know if they timed the release of that image or it just coincided, but they released it on her birthday. She just died. Uh, she passed away in 2009. It wasn't that long ago. There was a documentary I reviewed on her that uh, Jamita Jimenez made that was actually was pretty interesting. Uh. Anyone else got a comment on Pluto, Sharon? I'm, I'm taking bets on how many new moons New Horizons is going to discover now oh, yeah, that we're up to five. It'll, uh, every time we go by, when we went by Uranus or Neptune or Saturn, we always discover some new moons. And New Horizons is one of the one of the five spacecraft that is on its way out of the solar system. I always thought it was interesting they didn't put a a Pioneer plaque or a record or anything on New Horizons. They put a they put a few. Uh, knickknacks on board, I think, which will totally con confound any civilization that they put a Washington quarter, they put a uh, some of Clyde Tombaugh, the discoverer of Pluto's ashes, are on board. Uh, they put a few other odds and ends, but I think I thought it was a interesting. A little sliver of Spaceship One, as a matter of fact, they put on. Yeah, you know, that's so right. That's all right. these little gugaws, like you say. I, I was surprised they didn't put a record or a plaque or like they did with Voyager or Pioneer. I mean, they had the opportunity. It's it's kind of a neat thing to do. So, I mean, now we we could put a CD or a compact disc or something on there to, with a little auto player, a crank auto player or something. Some little hologram. I wonder if they would figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Some little hologram. Yeah. Press a button and a the little. record is Help so me, Obi Wan Kenobi. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Greetings yeah. from Earth. <laughs> Your a record is nice because you can you can play that even without a phonograph player if you know what you're doing. So. Yeah, and, the, and they have for CD, anything optical. The one I think it's the Pioneer with the record player. It's your Pioneer that they actually have a stylus equipped. It's it's carrying a, a record stylus with it, so they they have the rough instructions to how to play it. So. You can imagine the aliens would have very advanced record players. Well, when they find a Washington Quarter, they're going to think that's basically what we look like is giant head slugs or something. You know, it's, it's totally confound them. Aliens are hipsters. They'll they'll be down with the records. They'll get it. Yeah, exactly. It's gotta be vinyl though. Yeah, got it. Got it. Need it. Okay. Uh, so let's move on to the uh, to the 2020 rover and uh, and this is great. So <clears throat> now I've, the new rover, the next rover that's going to be going to Mars is going to look just like Curiosity, right? It's going to have, uh, but it's going to have different instruments on board. Yeah, I think I described this one in an article as, like, Curiosity, which is already a rover on steroids, on steroids. Um, it's kind of taking everything that Curiosity has that's awesome, in that it can do basically almost anything, and um, adding to that. So what's, what's kind of interesting about this rover is we've been, our whole thing on Mars has been to look for life and signs of life, and it's all about life and following the water, right? Well, now that we have the background to know that they're ancient Mars actually did have the right sort of environment to support life, now we're finally actually going to look for evidence of said life, not just the sort of abstract things, right? Um, Curiosity, of course, is looking at ch chemically what Mars could have supported, so um, that's going to be really neat if this thing does get off the ground, because um, we all know that budgets change and things don't necessarily happen. Um, how many times has the Mars plan been been set and then unset and set and then unset? Um, but the second thing that this rover is going to do that's really, really cool is it's going to collect samples and actually store them for a later mission to collect them and bring them back to Earth, which sure. would be awesome. Because um, part of the problem with, with any rover, with any planetary spacecraft, right, is that the design is frozen before launch. You can't be, like, fixing and tweaking and putting the latest thing on, like, two days before launch. So you end up with these these really great you know, pieces of technology that are great by 2005 standards, but not necessarily great when you get their standards. So it'll be really nice if it does, I mean, you know, a lot has to happen first, but if this mission works, and then the next mission works, and it does make it back to Earth um, and survives and doesn't, you know, die from radiation or something, mm -hmm. um, 
or get blasted so any life would be ruined. Um, it'd be really awesome to have this stuff on Earth where we could study it with what we have, you know, new instruments. And then study it again when we get better instruments in a decade. So that'll be really fun. Um, really hoping that the funding holds through on this one. But I feel like Mars is kind of popular enough right now that NASA's going to actually stick to this. Maybe. Well, well I think this is a great way to go about Speaking of budget. It, though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we're, we're going to segue into Casey in a second here. But I think this is a really great way to go about this, to take a platform, you've already worked at all the bugs, all the kinks, you've built the thing, you, it worked perfectly, it landed, don't reinvent the wheel, just make another one, and then another yeah. one, make, you know, and just like send one every two years, like just keep sending the same platform, but with different instruments, and I and think... This this is something NASA has done really well, is that they reuse technology because they know that it works. Like, the, the landing systems for Spirit and Opportunity were basically the same as the Sojourner rover before, and, you know, having this platform now with the Sky Crane that can deliver this massive payload to the surface is, like, just go with it. It works. Amazingly, it works. Just do it. So, it's, but look at I mean, nice look at the Russians. Keeping though, that right? cost down. You know, the Russians yeah. had the. You know, had, <laughs> how many? How long have they been firing off Soyuzes, right? And progresses, uh, and, right? They're or haunted by something. Yeah. 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 Or you look at the Venera program. It's just like you know, thirteen of them, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, something that's really interesting about the 2020 rover announcement uh, that we saw was. I was kind of struck by how boring it was. I don't know if anyone actually watched the telecon or listened to the telecon uh, from NASA. It was the most kind of listless, lifeless. Like, I feel like a lot of them are like that, though. This is I know, but this one just seemed particularly. It's like they announced the cash that's going to go on a rover. They've been wanting this for pretty much thirty years, right? This was a huge. The fact that they they recommended a cash. I got that it's weird in the fact that they're burying the lead a little bit, and I think that brings up yeah. this hesitance overall from NASA to really commit to a sent, returning those samples. This is why, if you look at the report, it's number three on the uh, on the priorities of this mission is to cache samples for eventual return. And so, NASA also didn't want you know they announced this rover without having the stated science goals of it. They announced the mission first, and then they convened this mission team, the science definition team. And they let the science definition team decide that it's going to have a cache, even though that had already kind of been decided by this big decadal survey official report a few years ago that that should be the next step in Mars science. And so there's a lot of hesitation in trying to sell this to the Office of Management Budget and other parts of the government is, is a real problem. And so I think that was kind of interesting to see how they presented it, uh, which wasn't the most like engaging way to do it. So do you think that that's them already kind of bracing for budgetary cut impact? A little. I mean, I think what there really is is that, you know, to really go get those samples and bring them back, you need essentially three flagship missions in a row. And the administration is not willing to commit to three flagship missions to Mars to get those samples back. And so it's kind of, in a way, I think it's a lot of facing each other down to see who's going to, calling each other's bluff. It's like, all right, you can put samples on there, but you'll notice in the uh, uh, discussion that they had in the telecon this week that they they kept hedging on when we would get those back. John Grunsfeld, who's the head of the science division at NASA, said maybe humans will pick up this cash and bring it back and if, when, when humans visit in the 2030s, which no one believes is going to happen. And I think that shows that these could sit theoretically on the surface of Mars for 20 years before even consider getting them. And so there's a real issue about who's going to be committed to this funding for these projects. Yeah, that issue of how do the samples are going to be brought back is a big one. And then the other big one that came up was looking for signs of past life versus signs of present or extant life. Why don't we just go ahead and, and have instruments that are designed to look for uh, the signature of current life on Mars. And so that generated quite a discussion and, and uh, uh, I think the people on the science definition team were saying that, uh, well, it's possible that, that you could come across those signs, but you want to build it so that you are a little more sure of getting results. And uh, if, you, if you go to the place where, where people think uh, it's most likely that present life can be found, you would have to look deep underground. You would have to look uh, in places that are relatively inaccessible, whereas the, the signatures of 
current or uh, past life might be a little more accessible to uh, a rover like the 2020 rover. But I think they're they're clearly feeling quite sensitive, even from the Viking experiments, right, where they yeah. had claimed that they had detected the presence of life chemicals on on Mars, and then you know other people had a real problem with the way the experiment was done, and and it just ended up being completely inconclusive. Although the people who did the experiment still feel absolutely certain that they d they discovered presence of you know of life processes on on Mars there was a really great uh, conversation actually had with some some scientists and they're saying that that there's a whole new set of experiments that have been designed and developed that would kind of try to repeat that experiment but this time what they would do is they would look for um, essentially the direction of life so I forget, I always forget which way this goes but life has a certain sort of direction that the that the helix, the double helix, the DNA is twisted and that you could search for the opposite twist the as well. Yeah. yeah, the chirality in the in the sort of sort of in the Martian soil. And if you were able to find that that it would give off a certain kind of, of sort of output chemical and if you could find that opposite chirality, that would just be, you know, absolute evidence that not only was there life on Mars, that it was actually you know, from a completely different uh, sort of source that it had started independently, as opposed to being connected to to life on Earth. So, I, so I think it's it's I think it's strange. I mean, it, it really feels like the 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 step by step has been so careful and patient and laborious and you know, and I think that a lot of people are just like, but let's just find life already. Mm -hmm. you know, There's another mission uh, that uh, people at Ames have been working on uh, called the Icebreaker mission and, and they're talking about flying in an instrument called the Signs of Life Detector or SOLID uh, that would use an array of antibodies to kind of test a wide uh, variety of uh, Martian soil samples for the presence of some sort of microbial life. So if we, as we get closer to 2020, you might hear talk about what else is in the works to, to do that search for life on Mars, whether it's past or uh, current. Well, I think okay. this really shows the need for the sample return in some sense, because what Amy was talking about, you, don't, you just can't anticipate all the ways you can search for something living or even signs of it having lived without really knowing what you're looking for. This is the problem with perchlorates. When in Viking, they heated up those samples, the perchlorates activated, they would have destroyed any organic molecules in their samples. And they just didn't know that. And there's a lot we don't know about Mars, and this is why you do, ideally, a quick sample return to bring that stuff back so you can run all different types of experiments on these samples. They, they need to get the uh, plutonium pipeline restarted for the Mars rover 2022. They're, they're, the DOE said they're going to uh, and NASA has a, uh, un a classified amount of plutonium for a few more missions, they say, but for MSL, they had to buy that from the Russians. So They're actually working on that. That's actually kicking up yeah. this yeah, year. Yeah, respawn yeah. up, yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to say hi to Sandy Springman, who just joined us from Arecibo Observatory. Hello, Sandy. Not actually at Arecibo hey. Observatory this week. I am in Washington, D.C., fresh from talking about how do you send robots or humans to asteroids to bring them back to Earth. Whoa, how do you do that? Uh, with a lot more money and a lot more time than we have. <laughs> and, and, and that leads me to Casey, who's going to give us an update on the budget. Casey, do we yes. have more money? No, we have a lot less. Uh, so <laughs> there's a bunch of stuff that just happened this week uh, in Washington. There's stuff with authorizing committees and appropriations. I'm just going to talk about the appropriations, because that's the oh, most important. Okay. That's the money that so where funny. money so actually funny. goes okay. from Congress to uh, the actual federal agencies that's approved. So they're dealing with 2014 next year, and the House committee that deals with this kind of funding uh, just approved NASA's budget for $16.6 .6 billion. And if you adjust this for inflation, if you look at the actual 2013 dollars all going back in time, this is the smallest budget that NASA's had to deal with since 1986. And that's pretty bad, actually. There's a lot more NASA's doing now than it was doing in 1986. And this is a really kind of bad situation to be in. So this is just the House. The Senate has to weigh in. The Senate's going to give probably more money, but then the problem is how are they going to reconcile these two things and where's NASA going to come out? And But the problem, is, and you're seeing this with, with asteroid redirect, with planetary science, with Earth science, something's going to give at the same time as they're trying to build SLS and Orion. And NASA's just horrifically overextended and at the same time they're just cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting their budget. <laughs> 
and there's just no good news here. What do you think is going to give? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, SLS and Orion seem to have the strongest political backing. The big rocket and the crew vehicle have a lot of backing right now. Those will give last. Uh, they've stated their goals of the top priorities of NASA. It's SLS, Orion, it's the commercial crew program, and it's JWST. So anything not in those four things probably will give somewhat. We're already seeing planetary science go. Uh, a lot of Republicans in the House are going after Earth science right now. Uh, there's all the other aeronautics and running NASA centers, and you're seeing sequestration hit paychecks and uh, potential uh, uh, was it days where they don't get paid? I forget the exact term for that. Furloughs? Uh, furloughs? Furloughs, yes, yeah. So there's all sorts of things that are going to give, but overall this will lead to a weaker space agency. Right. Uh, yeah, no, this is, uh, this, is a bad, this is a very bad scene. I mean, I've, I've ranted about this in the past. I think Amy has, has heard directly my rant about the fact that, that it's crazy that, that these even have to compete for the same dollars, that planetary science and human and space exploration are two just completely different endeavors, and they shouldn't be pulling from the same, the same budget. Science is important because we need science, and it should, just, it should know how much budget it's going to have available year after year after year and not have to think, oh, you know, the, what do you know? The new launch system ran over budget. Surprise, that, surprise. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> that guts, you know, that guts the, you know, the, the science programs. And then what do you know? The James Webb Space Telescope went over budget, that's going to delay us returning to the moon or whatever. So it's, you know, it's too bad that these things are so interdependent on each other. That it would be nice if they could be somehow separated and then not. And you know, they could then feel free to go over budget on their own, but then at least they would, you know, they would impact themselves and not other programs across the way. Yeah. Yeah, and what we're really seeing is the effect of this sequester. Uh, this is the across the board cuts to all federal kind of spending that that isn't mandated by law and we're really seeing that this year and next and again we're, NASA has less to deal with and it has worked with and it has in 30 years basically and that's a really bad that's a huge step backwards and I think most people who are who are watching this right now are are really used to just being just bathed in mountains of material of educational material and wonderful animations and photographs and videos and live streaming stuff and all the stuff is a lot of that comes out of this stuff that's going to get sequestered. So you're going to start to see a lot of these these wonderful educational resources start to dry up. I know it's hitting CosmoQuest. It's hitting a lot of other organizations out there. And uh, the JPL Open House, for example. Uh, they had 50,000 people come by and see JPL on a personal basis. That's canceled this year because they don't have that kind of education funding. Yeah. Two, 2013 is the first launch that the year... Amy, you're had. next. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I just have a question. <laughs> Since we're talking about sort of um, separating manned and unmanned exploration, um, Casey, as the budget guru, do you know how much, what percentage of NASA's funding typically goes to manned spaceflight? I've heard it's something in the order of like 70%. It's something a little bit insane. It's not quite that much right now, and for the last few years, it's been around 45 to 50 percent. So it's about usually half of its budget, and and it's a little weird because you can say that you know NASA spends almost three billion dollars a year just on all of its centers, and you can say a lot of those centers mainly support the human spaceflight program. So it kind of goes back and forth, but directly, it's about half usually. Right. <laughs> All right, so let's move on uh, to complete fantasy, which is that it's 66 years after the Roswell crash landing. I did it. Oh, and <laughs> Sandy, you're, you're muted. Are you still oh. muted? You're still muted. I've been to Roswell. It's a great town. <laughs> did you see aliens while you were there? Um, Maybe. I think I might have been with a foreign national. <laughs> no, every Is every lamp bad? post in Roswell has lights on top that look like alien heads with little alien eyes. So they could really hide in Roswell. Oh yeah, they, I mean the museum's I, amazing, I, fantastic. I, I, every piece of Roswell memorabilia. I, I An alien opto autopsy is uh, going on inside the museum. So. Yeah. I've been there. To, uh, I asked them there if anything was actually the real artifacts from the crash, and they said no, it's all replicas. So, yeah, I I wrote a little item just noting that uh, that you know, 66 years after it happened, it it really is passing into the realm of legend, maybe like Sharknado. 
uh, <laughs> where it doesn't really there's there's no new information really that comes up. And actually, there's a there's a there's a new book coming out uh, from Don Lincoln at Fermilab that that looks into the uh, alien phenomenon, uh, alien universe, I think it's called, and uh, it notes that. Uh, Roswell really didn't make that much of a splash at the time. It was uh, many years later. Uh, it had a couple of waves where uh, ufologists uh, kind of brought it into the public eye, and it really the tale really grew in the telling. Uh, of course, the basics of the tale are, are well known from anyone who's watched a CW series or anything like that, where uh, you have this discovery supposed of flying saucer wreckage, and at first it's reported in the newspapers that the military uh, has has found these anomalous artifacts, and then quickly the, the military said, no, it was really a weather balloon. And then decades later they said, well, actually it was a uh, balloon-borne experiment to monitor Soviet nuclear tests, but we couldn't tell you about that at the time, and, and there was all this talk about crash dummies being mistaken for alien bodies, uh, and there's really no way to, to sort this out as far as I can tell. Uh, Fifteen years ago, or yeah, uh, 16 years ago, I, I went down for the 50th anniversary, and there were still a fair number of people alive who who played a part in that, but uh, those people are gone now. Uh, Colonel Philip Corso, who wrote this controversial book, Walter Hout, who was the guy who put out the initial press release, Glenn Dennis, the mortician, uh, is still alive, but he is said to be ailing. And, and so there's no more information being added to it, and so it's just becoming this, this myth part of our cultural lore that uh, that continues to spawn spin-off stories. There's not a day that goes by that you don't get some sort of advisory about a UFO sighting somewhere, but uh, there's, there's really no way to kind of bring new information to the table as far as I can tell. There was a good, uh, I don't know if you even saw, Google actually put as their little doodle, they had a little thing on Roswell oh, yeah. on the, on the <laughs> birthday, and there was sort of a subsequent... Uh, complaint from people in the space community because like why do they spend any time you know boosting this pseudoscience when they could be showing off real science and yeah it really is like sharknado isn't it <laughs> i think ufo days just passed their annual ufo days yeah. it's a big tourist draw for that city mm -hmm. which really roswell is it's a tiny little it wouldn't no one would have heard of it had it not been for the crash it's a tiny little town i do have a story uh, just uh, take 30 seconds that, like I say, I was down there for the 50th anniversary on July 4th, 1997. I don't know if uh, you remember what else happened on July 4th, 1997, but that was the day that the Mars Pathfinder uh, landed, landed on uh, on the Red Planet. And so it was really interesting. NB MSNBC had a big thing down there in, in Roswell, uh, and uh, for us, uh, we were talking all about this UFO lore and uh, the questions about aliens, and then we had a real-life alien story come come on our hands. And for us, we were just blown away by the real science of seeing this machine land on Mars and send pictures back. But I think for a lot of the people who were at the UFO festival, they were just entirely oblivious to it. They they <laughs> didn't you know they were so keyed into the alien costumes that it, it was funny how how small of an impression it made on the Roswell clan and how big of an impression it made on us who were actually watching it on TV. There's a great comment here on YouTube from Colin Jones. With the vast majority of developed world people carrying cameras on them all the time, why haven't we seen a subsequent explosion in UFO footage? Not to mention us amateur astronomers who are out looking every night. I mean, we rarely see it. It always seems to be somebody that's relatively uninitiated with looking at the sky when that sees UFOs. But even so, you amateur astronomers would have as well some kind of camera with you or, you know, your mobile yeah. phone or whatever, and you'd be able to ca capture a picture of it. Or well, the, I think, I think, I think the conspiracy they, oh, go theorists ahead. have found other conspiracy theories to lash on to. <laughs> yeah. Also, I think you have to want to find the alien to see the alien. <laughs> um, I, I guessed hosted an episode of uh, Spacing Out on Open Minds TV a few months ago, because they're in Phoenix, and I was in Phoenix, and I met some of the guys there that actually are alien hunters, and they they want to see aliens, and they have. And they have a collection of cameras on which aliens have been photographed. 
through which, rather. It's very interesting. It's, a, it's an interesting mindset to sort of talk to the people who live this world. Speaking of television and people being on television, Amy, <laughs> uh, you've been on television quite a bit recently. Yeah, um, yeah, I did a couple of interviews actually in March that have just aired. Um, it's weird that they happened a, a week apart and then aired a week apart, but um, the weather or the travel channel of all things did um, a show about monuments and they wanted to talk about Gemini 8. So they came to me. Um, and the other one, which I actually haven't seen either of them because I don't have cable, <laughs> um, but the other one was on, oh god, what was it? The Military Channel about myths about Apollo 11, which was kind of fun because I got to research all these weird things that about Apollo 11. And it was my birthday, and they brought cupcakes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll save all the Apollo 11 stories for next week because the next week is the 44th anniversary of the launch. So. Oh, great. Yeah. Saving that. <laughs> uh, so uh, another piece of news here: they've uh, they've set up the new space shuttle Atlantis exhibit at the Kennedy Space Center. And has anybody done their duty and gone and seen it yet? I saw them putting Atlantis into the building before. I they saw it when it was shrink wrapped. A few Did you? Did you really? <laughs> All right. I saw it on TV. Uh, I've actually gone and seen the Endeavor one in California, and it's terrific. And it's just the beginning, so it's at the California Science Center, and it's, it's in this great big temporary hangar, uh, but it's sort of in sort of it's sitting on its wheels, and so you can just walk right underneath and look up. It's just amazing. But the plan is they're actually going to stack it up, so they're going to have a fuel tank, they're going to have the solid rocket boosters, and they're going to have the whole thing uh, stacked up, which is going to be just terrific. So, uh, but now, but now Atlantis has found its permanent home at Kennedy Space Center, and I got hey. a cool picture here. I, will. I like that I, they I, have the canned arm out too. And Fraser, uh, here in Seattle, we've got the full fuselage trainer, which you know has never flown in space. But on the other hand, you can walk through the payload bay, and you can actually walk in, in, in climb into the cockpit as well. This is the the artifact uh, that was used to train uh, astronauts. Nothing in the cockpit really worked, but it was a way so that you could tell which switch was where. And uh, they're letting people go in, in inside, so that's pretty cool too. The, the neat thing about this one is they've got it sort of at an angle. The one in the, the one wheels. yeah, the JSE, and it's actually pretty tiny. Yeah, and the wheels are are up on this one, so it's nice and smooth on the bottom. And but they've got it sort of positioned sideways. You can kind of see like right into the the open it's, bay. You can see the open bay there. It's at a. It. It is purposely angled at a 43.21 degree angle, so the the, uh, the numbers read out as 4321. Huh. Really? That's a little nerd humor. That is <laughs> super nerdy. That's, that's, that's amazing <laughs> that you knew that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you if you haven't, they seen talked it, about it on. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that if you if you haven't like seen these yet, now that they're all starting to pop up in the various centers around the United States. They're just, it's phenomenal. It's one of the most amazing things to be that close to this amazing machine. I mean, for all the expense and, and when you think about all of the people that tragically lost their lives in it trying to explore space, it's just, you know, it's it's hard not to be totally overcome when you're right next to it. So uh, if you haven't already, wherever you live, there should be a space shuttle relatively close to you. And, and I recommend that you... You know, make a road trip of it. Next time you're you're planning your next vacation, include one of these centers in your in your vacation. All right. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> Matthew, you know, you put this on the list, and I and and so I I mentioned at the beginning. Should we send a probe to Uranus? Yes. Uh, Careful Fraser. how you answer that. Yes. 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 All right. Uranus. First, pronounce it Uranus. Why? I believe Uranus is also a perfectly appropriate uh, it just means pronunciation. Your Snickers and people. I know, I know, yeah. I love it. That, there, there, it's a teachable there, moment. It, it encourages science, science. And we should get the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America to sponsor it. <laughs> All, All right, right. So, wow. go hit yeah, us. There back. we go. Oh man, oh man. All right, all right. But there, there is actually, actually, this this does highlight something though, because as soon as you say the name of the planet and pronounce it Uranus instead of Uranus or Uranus if you want to be really Greek about it. Um, but uh, it, it, as soon as you mention the name, people make jokes about it, but there are actually very good reasons to send a mission there for the simple reason that a lot of exoplanets 
uh, planets orbiting other stars that we've we've found actually more closely resemble uh, the ice giants Uranus and Neptune then resemble Earth, and so there's a lot of interest in understanding these worlds. And frankly, both Uranus and Neptune have only had one visit from probes each, and there's the same probe Voyager two, and that was more than 20 years ago. Well, Neptune is hard to get to right now because of the relative positions of the, of the worlds, um, but Uranus is still within reach. So if we launched a probe fairly soon, um, we could still use the slingshots from Jupiter and I believe Saturn as well to get a probe there and put it in orbit and drop a, uh, a second probe into the atmosphere like, like the Galileo probe had. And so there's there's talk, and it's not it's not anything like it's not even as far as the the Mars 2020 proposal yet. It's just a we should do this because the window of opportunity is closing soon. Um, if we put an orbiter in in orbit around it, and and arguably Uranus is the weirdest planet in the solar system. Um, it's the one that's tilted on its side. It rolls around the sun like a ball, um, so its seasonal variations are very strange. Um, but it also, uh, you know, it, it also seems to be a different kind of world than a lot of the other ones we've we, we've got around. So um, it seems like it's worth it worth a go and what are, what are we all about but finding out new things and it's a planet in our solar system no, come absolutely. on we don't know enough about the planets in our solar system but don't we really want a an orbiter with a attached you know module that can drop in like you know when we dropped galileo in you get or galileo had a had a probe that it um, or actually in the end galileo crashed into the into the planet jupiter and right. you know you got you know a few minutes of interesting science, and then that was that for Galileo. So, I mean, we really need a Cassini, a Cassini yeah, a Cassini, Cassini. class, right? Well, so the, we there is an orbit. Orbit. the orbiter is in is in the in this proposal that I'm looking at. Yeah. Um, if you don't want to put a uh, if you don't want to put something in orbit, it is a little easier because then you can have it just do a flyby. That's the New Horizons model. Um, and that you don't have you don't have the kind of urgency. The whole thing about the urgency of this particular probe is that it would be a Cassini style right. orbiter um, that would be you know lingering long enough to get as much information about the planet and its satellites and its its rings as well. Yeah, um, well, we were really lucky with the Voyager missions because you had this great planetary alignment. You had Jupiter and Saturn and, and Uranus and Neptune mm -hmm. all lined up in a way that you could slingshot from one to the other to the other. Mm -hmm. And now you just can't do that anymore, right? No, no, unfortunately. Which is why gonna, a Neptune mission is probably not going to happen. For I was going to say, a lot of people don't realize we only got one brief look at Uranus and Neptune with Voyager 2. So we've right. never been back. Yeah. And all Matthew, this emphasis on Mars. Boy, it'd be great if the NASA budget was increased and not decreased. Yeah, we need to go other places than just Mars. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew, Mars is who, cool. Who is There's other cool yeah. stuff. Who is proposing the Uranus mission? Is that something? Uh, that... This is, hang on a sec, this is Mark Hofstadter of JPL, uh -huh. who is a name that uh, that is known in planetary science. Um, not, a, not a crank or a crackpot or anything <laughs> of that nature. Um, and this is actually part of, this is actually uh, uh, oh, right along with the decadal survey uh, model. So it's it's not... Not so far fetched, and I believe there is a similar mission that's being talked about at ESA. What about Dawn? I mean, you know, Dawn is a great platform, although it's solar powered. That they stuck some kind of uh, nuclear reactor in it and sent it out there, you know, with a nice ion drive, and it could somehow slowly make its way into orbit. That I don't know. You'd have to ask somebody who's more of a uh... Space probe. Right, but I'm just going back to this concept. Like instead yeah. of us like reinventing the wheel, let's have a let's have a an outer planets explorer class platform and an inner planets class platform and a rover, and then just <laughs> rebuild the same thing again and again and again. You know, just sneak them into the Tesla factory while in between uh, battery operated you know battery cars. 
Is hey, I'm, I'm in favor of modularity. I'm going to see yeah. the Laddie March in uh, in September if all goes well, and that's a modular design as well. They have the the bass, and then they stick all the instruments on this on this basic design. So if we can reuse tech tech, that's that's great. Well, there's a there's a story we're just working on right now that we'll probably have in the next couple of days about uh, CubeSats with ion drives, and they'll be completely Kickstarter modular. You know, people can people can you know, fund them and launch them. So, you know, we're going to see more and more. So let's, let's do it. Let's gather together our money and let's build a CubeSat and uh, stick it atop, a, I don't know, a Falcon 9 and send it off to, to Uranus. I'm in. We'll do it. Um, all right. So I think the last thing I want to talk about was just the, uh, the crazy amount of sunspot activity right now. And... There was a yeah. sort of big one shot of flare that's just lost a couple of yeah, days. The, the, Actually, the, I'm going to say goodbye before... Uh, See you later. Later. Thanks for yeah, coming, the, Matt. The, the, the sun is starting to look more like its cycle 24 self. We're heading toward the 11-year the peak here in 2013 and 2014, but it's it's been kind of schizophrenic where it's been active one week and I'm out photographing the sun every day in, in hydrogen alpha and white light. And it's active one week, and then it's inactive the next week. And so this, this cycle's been kind of very schizophrenic. But we did have a big sunspot group that just passed over the, the earthward side facing of, of the sun. And there was some moderate auroral activity up for northern like latitudes around 45, 50 degree north that we're seeing some aurora this week. This, this sunspot group is rotating away, and we, have, we don't have anything behind it right now that's coming in. But it's, it's worth watching. Um, okay, good. Well, I think we're kind of run through all the stories that I had planned. Did anyone have anything else they wanted to bring up? Now, Sandy, you had you had posted a couple of links when you came in. Uh, you were talking about uh, moving asteroids. Asteroid redirect mission. Not retrieval so, anymore. Not retrieval. No, that's uh, we have gone more PC. So the idea, this is definitely coming out of more of the human spaceflight side of things rather than the science side of things, but. The idea is we take an asteroid, a near-Earth asteroid that's small, somewhere between 5 to 10 meters, and we park it in this uh, distant retrograde orbit where it'd be stable going near the moon for a couple hundred years, and then eventually we send humans to it, or we send humans to go pick it up and bring it back. And so this is a pretty big, hairy, audacious plan. It would cost a lot of money, and it would happen on a very compressed time scale. And some of you sci-fi fans might uh, know about Gentry Lee from JPL, who was there on Tuesday at one of these meetings. He's a uh, skeptic and a technocrat, as he was introduced once. And he was saying, There's, it's bold. There's no way you're going to be able to do this with the current timeline and budgets. It's you know, $1.6 billion or two-something billion dollars to be able to do this. Either way, that's a lot of money. It's you know, getting into like flagship class missions. That's and a mission to Uranus. <laughs> it's easily a mission to Uranus. I, I think missions to Uranus are a great idea. You would learn so much about these you know, outer planets, and also we assume a lot of exoplanets might be a little similar to Uranus and Neptune, so I think there's a lot of potential there. But back to asteroids, this might be a little too bold even for NASA. So a bunch of planetary scientists were talking on Tuesday and a little bit on Wednesday as well, uh, yesterday, saying how can we ensure that we get some science out of this mission should it fly? You know, what, what sort of asteroid do you want to go to? Can we detect these asteroids? Which we can. Not, well, they're very tiny, so they're hard. And then can you launch space telescopes to find these things as well? And some of the talk about this uh, asteroid redirect mission is also planetary defense. Could you, you know, could you get an asteroid out of the way if it was going to come kill us? Something that was bigger. Um, so there's, there's a lot to talk about there. And then also sort of in the context of planetary defense, a lot of people are saying, oh, these private space companies, they're going to be doing a lot of you know, defending us against killer rocks. But do you really want to privatize defense of the planet? <laughs> yeah, we'll save your planet, <laughs> but it's going to cost you. That's true. Yeah, well, but I mean, there's been a ton of great, dollars. yeah, there's been a ton of really great theories on how you might move asteroids with yeah, gravity tractors and with bouncing airbags and painting them one color and moving them around and, you know... So, I mean, but if it's spinning really quickly and if it's a rubble pile and you put it in a bag, you might shear off the outer layer. Blowing it up with nuclear missiles and shooting it with lasers and vaporizing it. There's, there's been a ton... So but we really need to know which one of these is going to do the trick. So well, I, think, I think... people are talking about, you know, put it in a bag and bring it home. But this would be a small one. This is an 8-meter asteroid. As uh, one of the curmudgeons noted that, you know, the one that exploded over Russia, how big was that? And you know, it didn't kill anyone. 
in well, that's, 55 that's meters or so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure could so, have. So, you know, is a small one really, you know, relevant for the larger ones? We know a lot more about the larger ones than we do about the smaller ones. There's a lot of sort of caveats about what we know about these small ones. So shouldn't I mean should they send the mission should have like a like a bouncing airbag on it and a tra gravity tractor and a laser and a bag and all these things and it could just try its different methods one after the other to see which one was most effective that's a paint gun you know and then it could see sort of what works and what didn't work and then they can they can compare and then you know all future asteroid defense plans will be based on whichever worked it'll be like mythbusters actually let the mythbusters do it there you go there you go. We can go. We can go raise money in Silicon Valley. It'll be great. Yeah. Be Mythbusters great might have more, you know, regular funding for this kind of thing too. Yeah, yeah but we'll just like throw the problem at them, and they can come up with a bunch of bunch of solutions and bolt them onto a spacecraft. Give them a common platform <laughs> that they can use. Well, they're calling this mission an ARM asteroid redirect mission, and if it's robotic, the asteroid uh, robotic redirect mission. So ARM, this is a pirate's favorite mission. <laughs> and honest, honest engine. They are going to put a hook on it and a tether. So it's, I mean, the 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 potential is unlimited. Yeah, yeah. No, this is great. <laughs> Bolt an ion engine onto it. Shoot. Uh, hook up some kind of rail gun onto it and shoot mass off. I love it. I love it. I want to see all this stuff happen. All right. Space potato gun. Uh, space potato gun, yeah. Bunkin' junkin'. Um, okay, well, let's wrap this up then. So I'm going to sort of say goodbye to each one of you and give you a chance to promote whatever it is that you're doing. So first, Alan Boyle, where can we find out more? Well, the easy thing is to go to cosmiclog.com, and that will bring you to NBC News Science, where I hang out. So science.nbcnews.com is another way to do it, or you can follow B0YLE on Twitter. All right, and Sandy, where do we see more? Uh, at Sandy on Twitter. Nice. Amy, your title. In addition to the multiple television appearances. <laughs> TV, yeah. Yeah, that which, yeah. which is totally legit. Can you imagine a television show? Oh. Yeah, people trust me. Oh my god! I know. I know. <laughs> you can see me on the military channel. Actually, not anymore. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at AST Vintage Space um, and Google Plus as Amy Sure Title. And then I also write for uh, Discovery News, oh, uh, Al Jazeera, Device, Motherboard. Uh, around, I'm around. All space history, all the time, for the most part. Casey, in addition to Planetary.org, uh, Explore Planets on Twitter as our main account. And uh, check out the blogs. Emily also blogs there, too, who's a much better blogger than I am. Oh. oh, so, oh. So, so Wait, that means you should blog on. more and You're get fishing better. For yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm working on it. I have a lot to reach to. It's, yeah. I have to just acknowledge the reality of this. Emily is pretty great. Yeah, it's no, I mean, great. Yeah, it's you, you can find both of us. You get there. better and better every time. Yeah, yes. just keep comparing so yourself to Emily, and that'll, that'll work. <laughs> uh, I have a YouTube video about the 1980s in my post about NASA's budget being the lowest since the 1980s. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm working there. And you just blogged about that right now? Yep, it's on planetary.org slash blogs. All right, Sweet. I will, I will, I will oh, retweet that right now. You see, you tell us the things you work on, and then we will get the word out for you. Thank you. David, where do we find out more? I am at AstroGuys with the Z across all platforms, and when it's cloudy out, I'm generally in writing for my own website, AstroGuys.com, Universe Today, Frequent Quirk Contributor, uh, Listasaur.com, Schmoop for uh, curriculum development, and I have an uh, article out in the August issue of Sky and Telescope, which covers social media and the virtual star party. Awesome. That was great. Yeah, we were mentioning that uh, that you was in the an actual magazine. Again, a you know, that your article was in I've, Sky and Telescope. I've been pitching that around to some other magazines, but they're one of the few that actually bit on that one. So, uh, I mean, I may be able to get it in a few other magazines, too. That's great. Can Do I add one more pitch? Legit? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to be up in Seattle next Tuesday. There's going to be a science cafe with the Pacific Science Center. Uh, I'll be there. A Mars scientist from Curiosity Mission will be there if you want to get together and talk about space. It's a free, wow, free event, yeah. planetary.org slash events. And, and when is that? Uh, Tuesday, uh, July 16th at 7.30 p.m. That sounds great. That may summon uh, Alan. 
From yes, his, indeed. Uh, Are you in Seattle? Okay. From his, yeah. from his, uh, from yeah, his from raspberry his, picking. From, right. his raspberry, <laughs> from his raspberry patch. <laughs> awesome. All right. That sounds so mythical. <laughs> I'll bring some jam. Oh, well, yeah. Please Thank come. You. Sounds great. Uh, so the next uh, thing we're going to be doing is the virtual star party on Sunday night when it gets dark on the West Coast, which is like forever. Uh, so it'd be like probably 9.30 is when we're going to start. But we're, you know, the days are getting shorter again, so we'll start moving the other way now. So this Monday is morning. Yeah. yeah, it's where we hook up a bunch <laughs> of telescopes into a live Google Plus Hangout and just show you whatever is happening in the night sky. Um, okay, cool. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And we will see you all next week.